a lot. And um, being in Herefordshire, it's a, it's a bit of a frustrating area to be. We haven't, as I've discussed later on, we haven't sort of got a, a lot of focuses for, for, for migrant birds to channel them. However, you know, there are, there are places within Herefordshire where it certainly works and where we've had some interesting counts of, um, of commoner species as well as some scarcer species going through. However, much of my visible migration work is um, that I, I do is down on the Severn estuary. Um, as you can see by the, this is the old Severn bridge and um, a big chaffinch day during the autumn where we had um, about two and a half thousand chaffinches go through in a couple of hour period. So um, let's um, get going. So um, I'm going to talk to you in this talk really about, um, God, there we go, um, the species that we see during um, visible migration um, and the ones that we're not going to see because they, they migrate by night uh, and why these species use these different methods of migration. Um, then we're going to discuss a bit the, the weather conditions that sort of affect why, why birds are moving, in which direction they're moving, what triggers migration. I'm going to go through the probably easiest way of doing it. I've decided, as you'll see by most of my slides, is going through the migration year, um, starting off in the early spring where we are now, all the way through to, to winter again. Um, have a quick discussion against what is leading line migration and um, in off the sea visible migration, and a brief chat about to what makes a good visible migration site, geographical factors. Um, that affect it and the species that you're likely to see in different parts of the country or different um, different visible migration sites. And then quick chat about the um, resources that if you decide to get involved in this or want to see a bit of it, um, some useful books, websites, etc., that might give you some more information. Um, so right, moving on. So why do some migrants travel at night and others by day? So obviously with visible migration, we are looking at diurnal daytime flying birds that um, will often do relatively short distances each day, building up into what can be very long distance migrations. So um, why do some species go by day? Well, often we're looking at flock flying species, so things that travel in flocks and often feed in flocks. So again, things like red wings, field fares, starlings, wood pigeons, finches, pipits, wagtails, they'll often fly as a flock. Whereas lots of species like our little leaf warblers, things like chiff chats, willow warblers, wood warblers, the chats um, such as red starts, and then other species such as pied and spotted flycatcher are totally nocturnal migrants. You really do not see these birds flying by day. They're usually a completely different method of migration, different cues um, and different navigation methods. So um, nocturnal migration, I'd say this is this is very much of things like um, oh, sorry, a dog in here, just try and move it. Um, so very much things like the warblers, chats, um, and some species, when they're doing the over sea part of a migration, will try and do that by night rather than during the daytime. So why are they doing this? Well, they're first of all less likely to get predated. A lot of these species are relatively weak flyers, and they um that they, they're woodland dwelling species quite often, things like willow warblers and they fly by themselves. So they're very, very susceptible to predation by things like peregrines, merlins, sparrowhawks, etc. cetera. Um, species also that um, often go by night, they can often be the smaller species and they're feeding on insects a lot of the time. So frankly, during the day, they need to be feeding up and fueling up for often these huge migrations. When you think about something like a sedge warbler, which um, weighs something around 16 grams, which does a, can do a non-stop flight from the UK to the Sahel, two and a half thousand miles, absolutely non-stop. They will be flying day and night, but they, they will go all the way through the night because they need the daytime period to be feeding up before their migrations. Things like chiff chaffs, you'll see in the morning, you'll often get the fall on a claggy morning in early April when there's a bit of a northeast breeze and you've got that bit of rain and drizzle and you go to a hedgerow and it's suddenly full of willow warblers, white throats, black cats and these birds have been traveling through the night, they've found the first available cover, they've been grounded by poor weather and they need to feed, they spend all day feeding like mad, often during this feeding they will actually be moving in a northwards direction along hedgerows or whatever other leading lines but actually they're, they're really feeding during the day. So um other species, so the other reasons for um, migrating um, 
at night is celestial navigation. So again, species like the warblers, particularly chats as well, things like wind chats, um, wheat ears, they're in the, when they're in the nest as very young chicks um, between the period when their eyes open to about four days and they fledge at about 17 to 20 days. It's a very short period. It's believed that they're forming a celestial map of the stars and they're using this to migrate. So they obviously need to, to migrate at night to be able to use, to use this celestial map. So Diana migration, we're often looking um, at open country species, which are found in, in flocks. Um, they're much less likely to be predated. They're often far strong flyers. The fact they're in a flock means if there's another 300 chaps with you, the chances that you're gonna be the one that the Merlin or Peregrine picks on is are much reduced. Um, often graniferous species as well. So they don't actually need to spend as much time feeding during the day. So they'll often migrate during the period of the morning from sunrise for about three or four hours, and then they'll feed for the rest of the day. They've got a lot, they've got enough time to feed during the rest of the day. Large raptors um, and things like cranes and storks um, are also key species found on diurnal migration. A lot of these guys um, rely upon thermals, and obviously thermals only occur during the daytime. So they're using warm up drafts from hillsides and they'll often spiral up, thermal up in these cauldrons up to thousands of feet in height. And then they just set their wings and will travel miles and miles off this single back of this single thermal. It's very, um, uses very little energy. And there, a lot of these species are, are, are relatively or power flyers. So again, we're looking mainly at things like storks, some of the larger eagles. So if you were to go to Gibraltar, you watch here at the moment, a lot of black kites coming through, short-toed eagles, booted eagles, which are all using thermals from North Africa, to get them across the narrowest point at the Strait of Gibraltar. So they need the daytime. Some species um, are very much using um, cues in the landscape. So um, species like geese and swans, um, they will fly at night and they will definitely do sea crossings at night very happily. But once they're coming over land, they're often using cues of landscape to which they memorise in future years. So when um, a group of hooper swans come over from Iceland, for instance, air will bring their signets with them and those signets will learn the landscape, they'll see the butt of Lewis as they come over and they'll come over the Macare into the Eastern Hebrides and over onto the west coast of Scotland, and they'll be picking up visual cues. And those birds, those um, young cygnets, in future years will remember those to know where they actually are in the landscape. So that diurnal daytime migration suits species like this very well. Um, so right then, the visible migration year, I think this is probably the best way of um, explaining the factors that affect it and the species you're likely to see, particularly in this part of the world. Um, so it really starts around and about now. I mean, we're, we're into mid-March now and um, things sort of started to trickle through in February, end of February. The first, very first meadow pipits would have started to head north back to the Pennines and the North York, uh, the Yorkshire Moors and the Welsh Moors. And the first Hooper swans would have been heading back up towards Iceland. They'd do it in short stages. But this um, count here is one that um, my friend Matt and I carried out on the Severn estuary um, back on Saturday the 6th of March of this year and it gives a good indication of species which are moving at this time of year. You can see the first of the meadow pipits with about 60 north and the gulls start to move, things that we often don't think of as hugely migratory species, things like black-headed gull, lesser black-back gull, herring gull, common gulls. These are all definitely birds on the move. Um, and again, we're seeing there a merlin. This was um, tracking the, the meadow pipits up north and um, preying on its food supply as they go. Very much so, we were heading to mid-March and this is when the meadow pipits, which um, these are, uh, to a lot of people, a little brown job. They're found out in the moorlands of, of Wales, Northern England, all the way through Scotland, into the Faroe Islands and Iceland, and even into Greenland. Um, there are species which winter um, all the way down to very north of Africa, through all the Iberian Peninsula, up through France, and even a few, quite a number winter in the south of Britain, particularly around estuaries in the South Down country. And once we get into mid-March, we start to see the first return of meadow pipits um, heading back north. These early birds are probably British breeding birds, um, which don't have to suffer the 
the real harshness of climates that the northern breeders do. So they tend to return to breeding territory early. This count shows one um, at Salak in South Herefordshire, where you can see in a very short period of time before work, 40 minutes, we had 118 meadow pipits through. That day, probably in this little part of the world, we'd have had 500, 1,000 of this species moving up through and um, heading back probably to Welsh moorland at this time. Other early season species that we're likely to see are the, the red wings and field fed, Scandinavian thrushes, which breed up in um, northern Scandinavia all the way into Russia. Um, some of the red wings go to Iceland, or very few of these birds that we see in Herefordshire will be of Icelandic origin. Just before we came on to this talk and I had a, a message from one of the chaps that watches from the Yorkshire coast and just as it was getting dark on the Yorkshire coast, he had flocks of blackbirds spiraling high up into the sky over the North Sea and heading out east. Those birds by that morning will be landing in Scandinavia. Blackbirds that you have had wintering in your garden, that you will have seen in your garden, could be and are very likely to be breeding in Finland or Sweden this year. Most ringing recoveries of foreign bred blackbirds from Britain are of Finnish and Swedish origin. So just think about that. Next time you see blackbird, a robin, song thrush, a lot of these species we think of as sedentary are actually long distance migrants from the far north, from the boreal zone. Um, so yeah, here we can see, um, sorry, there's a few graphs in this talk and I hope I don't lose too many of you during the course of it because of it. But um, we can see meadow pipits passage. Here's a lovely picture of one of these little brown jobs, which personally I think are one of the most charismatic and enchanting little birds, the fact that this bird that you see flying over a Herefordshire hill could in two months time be on the, the Icelandic tundra um, alongside things like deer falcon, an arctic fox, um, and it's going over a Herefordshire hill somewhere near you probably in the next two weeks. But we're here we can see a graph which shows the peak dates. But at the moment, around about the 19th of March, um, Things are really picky up now. These are probably these are probably birds which have wintered in in Europe, probably France, and they're, they're as I say they're going to British breeding grounds. Now you can see a real peak comes at the first week of April, around about the second of April. And now this is this is the Icelandic and the Faroese birds. These are big populations, a huge area of land up there, and a massive number of meadow pipits head through us. This is when we start to see very large numbers. Down on the Severn Estuary, it's not unusual for us to see about 2,000 meadow pipits head through on a, on a good late March, April morning. Um, and another real species at this time of the year that we start to see heading back are chaffinches, another bird table regular that I'm sure a lot of you see on a very, very regular basis. Now, you, you probably, again, think of these as very much a British breeding bird and a high percentage of the population do, do definitely breed in Britain. However, an awful lot of birds, particularly the females that you see in winter, will actually be, again, of Scandinavian origin. These things have a fascinating uh, migration strategy. Their um, Latin name, Fringilla sealobs, um, refers to them as bachelor finch. Now, the males, which will stay mainly back on continental Europe and even into Scandinavia, trying to survive the harsh Scandinavian winter to be back on the breeding territory, be on the breeding territory early, establish territories ready for the females to return. Whereas a lot more of the females come over to Britain and um, Western Europe to winter in much milder climates. And they do an odd thing. Um, at this time of year, we're seeing them heading southeast um, across somewhere like Herefordshire or down on the Severn Estuary. And you might think, why are these birds heading southeast? Well, they're actually crossing Britain to go out of Britain at the narrowest point across from Dover um, and Kent. So at the moment, going along, these birds will be heading all across Cotswolds, the Chilterns. They'll be hitting the south coast and they coast along the south coast. And there's guys at the moment getting counts in the morning of three hours, of about seven to eight thousand chaffinches in the morning heading across. Um, ready to, they're building up, their numbers are building and building, they're waiting for light winds. And then they're going to cross into France, Belgium, and then they're going to head up through the Low Countries and eventually get up into Scandinavia. So that little chaffinch that was sitting under your garden bird table a week or 10 days ago could at the moment be crossing the channel and um, possibly heading up for a Scandinavian breeding season before returning next autumn, hopefully having had a couple of broods of chicks. 
Um, we can see here with them very much that spring peak passage is early though. It's early March through to early April, then they very quickly drop off. So we are seeing peak chapping passage at the moment. So keep your eyes to the skies. You'll hear that classic little pink, pink call as they, um, as they travel across the top of you. And you'll often see little groups of five or six of them quite high on high pressure mornings. And you know those birds are, they're on their way. They're going back to Scandinavia. As the spring season progresses, um, things start to change. Say the meadow pipits and chaffinches dramatically tail off. You don't see any thrushes, they've all headed back. They're already back on their breeding grounds. But this is the main period for our hirundines, the swallows, house martins and sand martins. Towards the end of April, the first of our swifts come through and you're likely to see hobbies. I regularly have ospreys come through in South Herefordshire migrating over, tree pipits, um, yellow wagtails. Um, these species coming from sub-Saharan Africa and um, things like tree pipit could be heading right up into northern Scotland, birds on the east side of the country probably going up to Scandinavia. Um, in April the Severn estuary really um, starts to become a very productive place to be and another species that you think of as very sedentary and perhaps a garden bird that you're seeing on your niger seed or your sunflower hearts is the goldfinch. Um, um, but we see masses of these birds returning from the continent. They were a lot of these British bred birds and Scottish bred birds, particularly northern birds, will have wintered down in continental Europe, France, Iberia, and they will now be heading back up with mid-April. And um, on the Severn estuary, we can often see counts of about two or three thousand of these go through in a single morning and for days and days on end. So we're talking about very large numbers. And this is only a fraction that happened to be following the coastline under certain conditions. Very large movement. And um, as any bird is out there amongst you will know, a lot of, um, you know, we all like to see a scarce or, or rarer species. And um, late April and early May are a classic time on visible migration. Um, counts to see something probably from the Mediterranean. Um, things like bee eaters um, will often occur. Black kite um, and alpine swift. So what we need for this sort of species to occur are the big southerly winds that originate down in North Africa or the Mediterranean and make these birds overshoot. They basically get into the migration rhythm and they just don't stop and they suddenly go, oh, I'm in Britain. I'm 250, 500 miles further north than I should be. And they'll, you'll see them go through on these migration counts to sperm in Yorkshire. They very regularly get a species called red rump swallow, which is a Mediterranean, as far north they breed, is normally the Mediterranean. But every spring they get several of these birds which have overshot and they've gone, oh, crikey, I've got it wrong. And they're then heading back down south, down to sperm point, heading back into continental Europe to their breeding season. Um, Another little graph, I like my graphs, and um, this shows our swallow passage. So um, these fantastic um, hirundines, which have um, wintered down in as far as the Cape of Good Hope, so 6,000 miles from Herefordshire, um, traveled across all of Southern Africa, across the Sahara, which is now becoming a much longer migration, sadly with global warming, and um, much fewer, a lot fewer swallows are returning because of it. The, the, the length of the width of the Sahara is increasing and um, different wind conditions are affecting it now and far fewer swallows successfully make it back on spring migrations. It's one of the reasons that they're declined. But we can see by, by mid-April, there's sort of up to five per hour going through on most migration sites. That very quickly increases to the end of April being about 20 plus per hour. And we normally see a peak of them coming through end of April, first week of May. A lot of these late birds, again, we think when you see one of these birds going through, you think, oh, I'm probably going to breed somewhere in Herefordshire or Shropshire or somewhere relatively local. These late birds are probably actually heading up as far north as northern Scotland, Iceland, and on the east coast, some of them can be Scandinavian of origin. Um, a lot of our British breeders will be back in place by about the third week of April, the birds that we see around southern Britain. Um, so later birds are typically going a lot further north. Um, this gives a bit of an indication of a typical um, sort of late, sea, late spring day. This is down at Gluestone Boat on the River Wye, um, which is between Ross and Monmouth, and it's a place where I, I lived for uh, a little while, um, right on the river there. And um, you can see the you know, this, the numbers of birds that in, are involved in a relatively short period of time. You know, we're looking at hundreds of swallows going through, uh, hundreds of swifts and house martins, 
they're absolutely, I mean, in the course of an afternoon, almost 1,200 individuals on a very small patch of the Y. Had I been on the 7, this was during lockdown, up till the end of lockdown last year, um, not able to get down to the estuary, uh, would have probably been looking at 10 or 15,000 swallows in that period of time. Um, that's the, the percentage increase it would have been um, following up there. The Y is a relatively small tributary um, of migration by comparison. Um, and now we get into, you know, proper, once we're into May and we're on the estuary, there's a friend of mine, Matt, um, a day that he had, and you can see the diversity of species and we're starting to see some truly exciting species go through um, high Arctic breeders, things like dotrel, you know, these are birds which are gonna go into the high Scandinavian and Russian Arctic. And the brilliant thing about, you know, dotrel, we're looking at a bird which, we look at reversed, um, Sexual dimorphism. Uh, the females are bright and beautiful creatures, and the males are relatively drab. These doctoral that um, Matt's all going through um, could well, the females could stop in Scotland. They could lay a clutch of eggs for a male there and then um, head on and have a second brood in Scandinavia. These birds have travelled from North Africa and could take in the Cairngorms, have a clutch, and then actually end up in yeah, Northern Scandinavia, Russia. Also on here, we've got things like Wimbrel. These have come up from, um, from West Africa and are heading to, um, to Iceland. Most of the population breeds in Iceland, um, the Faroe Islands, some of them. And bar-tailed Godwit, which are heading to northern fellow Scandinavia as well. Um, black Terns, these are heading up towards continental Europe as well. They're going to end up probably in the Netherlands, somewhere like that. They're taking a bit of a wrong turn. Common and Arctic Terns, too. Um, difficult species to separate at distance when they're heading out across the middle of the Severn estuary. They look very similar, but the Arctic terns there will probably be heading some of them up to Greenland, Arctic Canada even potentially. Um, but you can see the, the real diversity of species that can be encountered on the Severn estuary on a, on a good spring day. Now, once we head into, into real late spring, summer, swifts, one of the this absolutely fantastic species, sadly fast declining um, due to old buildings but having their holes blocked up etc new developments not necessarily having space for them as well as less insects in the air to be honest that's high spiders these are a species which are feeding on um spiders unbelievably at huge altitudes which have gone up on their on their cotton threads and um they create these boluses of food in their in their mouth in their um, crops, um, which they're going to bring back to their chicks, which um, are nearly always formed of these tiny little spiders. They're a late migrants. They tend to head through late April. We start to see the first decent numbers, but it's really May before they get going. But what's fascinating about swifts? Um, we see this bizarre peak passage of movement in late June and July, which we think of as our peak of our swift season. All of us. You know, we see all our breeding swifts are around the towns. They're doing their mad screaming antics in the evening during June. But already by this time, a lot of them are heading back to Africa. They've, all, they've barely been in Britain for two weeks. And what these probably are, are young birds. Swifts don't typically breed till they're at least three years old, sometimes a bit older, probably. Um, so young birds have probably been drawn north. The migratory instinct has been within them. So they've come all the way up from East Africa, through Europe, into Britain, and they've got here, had a little bit of a look around and instinct is already drawing them back. There'll also be an element of failed breeders, birds which have returned, perhaps they're older birds which have found their nest sites have been de you know, developed. They're not able to use them anymore and they've not been able to find a suitable replacement, um, and their, or their eggs have failed to hatch, being predated, something like that, and they're already returning south. And we see these massive movements, particularly down the east coast of Britain, um, during the tail end of June and July. And we can see here up to 70 birds per hour going through by the third and fourth week of July. A lot of these counts will have come from places like Sperm Bird Observatory on the East Yorkshire coast. Um, but very quickly tails off, and they seem to slip away swifts because, you know, we, we would expect to see probably in early August um, a peak of migration with young birds, successful breeding adults all leaving us. But they've slipped away and possibly these birds are doing it at night. So their spring migration and their, the non-breeders exodus is a very visible thing, very obvious, you know, with places getting 20,000 swifts through in a day quite easily. 
Um, but then the, the successful breeders and young, they, they don't land, obviously, these birds. Once they leave the nest, these birds are on the wing and they're probably doing a lot of their migration at massive altitudes and at night. One interesting um, winging recovery was of a chick um, swift, which left the nest in Oxford. Um, they knew the date that it left the nest, first time ever. Four days later, it was picked up dead in Rome. It had traveled all that distance as a bird at about five weeks of age. Within four days of first taking flight from Oxford, it was in Rome. Here you can see the, the, the vast scale of swift passage. And you can also see again how you know, June, um, late June, early July is the peak of it. Sperm Bird Observatory is um, somewhere where I would urge anyone who has an interest in bird migration to visit. Um, and this is a, a, a truly moving spectacle to see um, this number of swifts on the move. And I, I would, if you, um, if you have a spare few days and we've got southwesterly winds in late June and early July, and you fancy a trip to East Yorkshire, I would definitely recommend it. You can see very much an East Coast phenomenon. We don't get this kind of counts of birds coming back down the West. Whereas in spring, we do see a lot of birds coming up the Severn. So it's as though they've done a northward trip up the West Coast of Britain, had a look, and then come back down the East Coast and are heading back to Africa. Now, crossbills, brilliant little species, probably something that um, a lot of you being sort of Herefordshire, Herefordshire borders, I, I expect will have um, come across in the coniferous plantations. Now, crossbills are a species which aren't truly migratory. They're something that we would call eruptive. So pine um, crops are very cyclical. You'll often find a pine cone crop comes every three to five years, depending on the species of pine. And crossbills are totally reliant upon pine cones as their food source. So in, in years where they sense that there's going to be a poor crop in the woodland that they've been breeding, they will move. And we think of migrants moving very much in the autumn, but this actually happens again in June and July. This is when the pine cones reach their absolute lowest ebb and the new crop is about to start. So they go looking for woods, different parts of the country where the pine crop is going to be good not just different parts of the country, different parts of Europe. So a lot of the birds that we will see on a big eruption year in July will have originated from, um, from uh, Western Russia. Um, and they'll often bring with them other species of crossbill called parrot crossbill and another even rarer bird called a two barred crossbill. But um, even within Britain, we every year see this regular exodus of crossbills heading down the east coast and down the Severn estuary um, in late June and July looking for new woodlands. And we see a second peak after their molt into the autumn, where again, younger birds and birds that have been able to have a second brood in good woodlands are now off looking for somewhere a bit better for the next breeding season, which for crossbills, unbelievably, starts in January and sometimes even late December. These birds have probably already had their first brood um, in some places, including Northern Scotland. So they've had snow on their backs while incubating a hard little bird crossbills. Now, September, and this is when it all really starts again. Um, and this, the, the bird in the photo here, um, I don't know if any of you recognize it, is a tree pipit, um, very similar to a meadow pipit, stronger build, better facial markings, and um, a very distinctive high pitched call, um, which as you get older, and um, I'm already classed myself in that bracket, becomes a little more difficult to pick up. And it's one of the best ways of picking these birds up. They'll often be in amongst a flock of um, meadow pipit. And to be honest, when they're 50 metres up against the sun, are impossible to distinguish. You're totally reliant upon them calling a lot of the time. They start to move through in late August, early September, with a very bright relative of theirs, the yellow wagtails. Um, we see big build-ups of these on the coast. If you're ever to go down to somewhere like Goldcliffe, um, which I'm sure some of you know, near Newport in Gwent, um, on a mid-late August day, wouldn't be unusual for you to see 50 to 100 yellow wagtails feeding around the feet of cattle. Now these birds are feeding up, um, ready to migrate, and they've already done a bit of their migration. They've hit the coast and they think, right, we'll have another couple of days feeding up here, and then they go. And you often get decent days of yellow wagtails passing through. Um, siskins, another lovely species. I'm sure some of you have been seeing them recently, probably on your feeders, because it's, there are species which come to feeders often late in the winter when their natural food supplies again, things like larch cones, um, alder catkins, um, start to run out. Uh, and you start to also 
see migrants coming through in spring. So some of those birds that you're seeing in your feed are probably things that have already come up from France and are heading back to Northern England. But August and September are a great time to see these birds. We think of them as a woodland bird, but when you're watching flocks of 50, 60 of them heading out across the Severn estuary, across the mud flats and the sea, um, and you wonder where they're, um, you know, where they're heading to and they're going down to the West Country and you think, where's their next stop going to be? They look very much out of place. And you'll see them at huge altitude on these lovely high pressure mornings of early September. I have very fond memories of last autumn. We had a big siskin year and they started pouring down the East Coast, some places getting four or 5,000 through in a single morning. Um, on the Severn Estuary, we were regularly getting about four or 500 a morning, not quite the same numbers, but um, the spectacular species, and they're lovely to see. They fly on these little tight-knit flocks, and they make these lovely little zizzing calls. They're very excited, um, enigmatic little species. Grey wagtails, um, again, a bit of a Severn speciality. Um, we've had some of the highest counts of grey wagtails and migration recorded on the west bank of the Severn Estuary. These are birds which have probably come down from Scotland, Westmoreland, Cumberland, Pennines, North Wales, Wales, and they're going to winter further south in Britain, um, but mainly in continental Europe, France, particularly in northern Iberia. And what they've done, they've followed um, often the Welsh valleys down the Usk, Y, smaller tributaries until they hit the Severn estuary. And then on days of a southwesterly, particularly a light southwesterly breeze, they hit the Severn estuary and they think, right, that's a bit of, that's a big span, span of water to go across. It's a bit breezy for us today. The, the migration instinct is strong in them. So they carry on flying and they what's called a coast using a leading line along the estuary. And they're normally very much a solitary species, grey wagtail. You'll perhaps see a pair on a little river um, during the breeding season. More often than not, you'll see them by themselves on a little stream. It's not unusual to see little flocks of eight or ten of these guys going through again very high and out across the right out across the estuary completely un grey wagtail like habitat and you know these guys are really on the move again by mid-month we start to see what i call as alba wagtails birders call them alba wagtails this includes pied wagtails which is our nominate form urelli of the of the white wagtail. So in Britain, we, we see pied wagtails. These are actually just a subspecies of a much larger group called white wagtails. Now, in Britain, we see white wagtails come through. These birds are all heading to Iceland. Um, at this time of year, they've just started, literally now, the last few days, the first white wagtails have been appearing. And they go through in early eight, through early April. By mid-April, they're sort of tailing off and you're starting to see the last of them, but again, they, they return back through in September traditionally. So they're a very difficult subspecies to separate from the pied wagtails, particularly when they're flying hundreds of meters out across an estuary. So we group them together and call them alba wagtails. These are heading back through. Um, the British bred goldfinches, linnets, lesser red poles, and chaffinches are all starting to migrate and build up and come down through the estuary. And at this time, the west coast, the Welsh side of the Severn estuary is the focal point of our migration watching. And as yet the continental birds, things like red wings, continental chaffinches, field fares, they've not yet started to move. It's, this is very much an early season place. So if you want to witness migration on a nice September day, go to the Welsh side of the estuary, somewhere like Goldcliffe or Undy are very good places to witness. And here we can see again the vast numbers of meadow pivots starting to go through, much, much more defined than in the spring, much larger numbers. This is all the youngsters that are obviously with them. A lot of these youngsters are not going to make it through the winter. Um, they're going to be become Merlin prey, basically. Um, so we're seeing vast numbers of these going through um, and mid-September, end of September is their peak time. Particularly on the, on the Severn estuary, we see a relatively early peak. Um, which indicates it's mainly British bred birds we're seeing. You can see some of the huge counts involved. Again, the sperm bird observatory um, does tend to take top pickings. Um, and this is going to be involving a lot of Icelandic birds going down the east coast with 20,000 through. And this won't be an entire day. You know, meadow pipit migration tends to dry up by about 10 o'clock in the morning. This will have happened in about three hours, 20,200 meadow pipits through. And you know, this is what's observed. Um, you know, there's, this is happening on a broader front. This sort of day, you could be looking at hundreds of thousands of meadow pipits crossing the country. And um, 
people travel to see something as dull as a wildebeest in Africa when we've got these fantastic creatures traveling much greater distances in much bigger numbers and it's um, a, an unknown spectacle to some of them. So um, I do urge you to go and have a look. Um, here we have a just typical day on the Seven Estuary at Goldcliffe, where you can see meadow pipits going through, just over a thousand of them, lots of um, lots of swallows starting to build up, and lots of pied and white wagtails, the Albert wagtails and siskins again. Um, you can see there were several of us out trying to count that day, and um, we probably still missed an awful lot of what actually went through, to be honest with you, and all these guys that was with a very good experienced bird as who love visible migration. So in October, and now this is when it gets really exciting and we see the Scandinavians come back, the red wings, the things like bramblings, field fares, the blackbirds are coming at night, song thrushes are coming at night. And from the northwest, from Greenland and from Iceland, we see these species like pink geese and hooper swans. Some of my best moments have been up in northern Scotland and, um, and the Isle of Lewis watching huge numbers uh, of pink footed geese that you know the night before, the afternoon before, we're leaving Iceland and they're making landfall and um, coming through in, in a single morning, I've seen about 10,000 pink-footed geese come down south through Caithness um, in huge, huge schemes, family groups, um, and it's very moving. You saw, I remember watching that, that morning, a single youngster which got separated from his family, you know, just left with mum and dad and siblings the night before and um, somehow got left, left behind and just circling around all morning, calling by itself. You do see some um, very moving things watching visible migration. Um, another day on the east coast at Spurn, um, and it was a raging um, northerly wind. We had hail showers coming down, um, it, was, um, it was bitter. Um, and we were watching Pomerine skewers coming down from the Arctic, one of the biggest days ever recorded. And um, at my feet, we had a little gold crest um, came in off the North Sea. It had probably spent about 20 hours out over the North Sea to make the crossing, bird which weighs around five grams. And um, interesting, on that same day, we were getting a lot of woodcock come in off the sea, um, this crepuscular woodland dwelling wader, um, beautiful birds. But most of the birds that we see, particularly in some of our heritage here, um, in the winter will be from Russia and Scandinavia. And wood, um, Goldcrest used to be known as Woodcock Pilots because it was believed that they couldn't make the crossing of the North Sea themselves. And they thought they used to sit on the back of Woodcock and ride them across the North Sea to make landfall in Britain. But no, Goldcrest do it five grams of little fluff and feathers, make it single handed against, you know, truly bitter conditions. But on this day, watching that little Goldcrest come in and make landfall at our feet. And then a few moments later, um, had a field fair, so one of our winter thrushes, and you could, I watched it from probably half a mile out, I picked it up initially in the binoculars, and getting lower and lower across uh, a crashing, win, you know, late autumn, early winter sea. And you could see it, just its motor was packing up, and it got closer and closer, and you thought it was going to go into the, one of the breakers at the back. And it just faltered through and landed about two yards onto the beach, just inside the surf. And um, yeah, it was probably one of the most moving moments I've ever seen. It was just, you know, this bird that's probably spent not far off a full day at sea, um, putting everything into it. And you think about the huge numbers under those conditions that just do not make it. Um, no, really, it's moving as well as fascinating. So um, East, once we get into, um, into October and the easterly wind start, you either want to be on the east coast of Britain, somewhere like Sperm Bird Observatory, or this is when the east side of the Seven Estuary comes into its own um, with the continental. So um, this um, example shows the east coast of um, Britain, um, East Yorkshire at its best. And um, one of the guys here, Keith Clarkson, has watched visible migration every day of his life for the last 30 plus years. Um, and probably knows more about it than um, I could in 10 lifetimes. Um, but you can see the massive numbers of bird in, birds involved on this single day with red wings, with 32,000 red wings coming in off the North Sea, over 4,000 field fares, blackbirds, even things like ring all coming through. And he describes it beautifully. He knows about visible migration. He knew this day was going to be a big one. Um, the conditions were perfect. Um, there'd been a build-up of thrushes in Scandinavia over the previous couple of days. 
northeasterly winds aiding their arrival. Low cloud cover, a bit of precipitation pushing them down, meaning you can see them. As often these birds will be traveling at thousands of feet high altitude and above what we can see. So on this day, he could actually see this happening. And he thought he knew where these birds were gonna make, make arrival, um, but he got it wrong. And by, by some nine o'clock, he hadn't seen many birds. This is his account. I just thought I'd put it on here. I'd let you have a bit of a, bit of a read, but he soon realized that the, the weather front um, hanging over the walls just inland was diverting these birds down over Flamborough to the, to the south of where he traditionally watches. And he'd seen virtually no birds. I can remember seeing messages from him saying, God, it's, there's nothing happening. I can't believe it. I thought this was going to be the biggest thrush day imaginable. And then he managed to find them and they were diverting south. So he was using a lot of field craft and seeing things from the thrush's point of view. He looked and thought, actually, there's a big weather front coming there. If I was a red wing, I'd fly to the south of that. And sure enough, he got onto this incredible line. And he described this day seeing lines of red wings two or three miles long, single lines of birds coming, trailing in off the North Sea, endless, um, which you can imagine to see 32,000 plus of them. And it must have been oh, a very moving experience and a truly up there with one of the great spectacles of wildlife watching in the world. Um, here we see field fair arrival, so we can see very much they're a later, they're a later arriver than um, the red wings, so only by a week or two, but we tend to see a peak um, tail end of October, very early November. But what's fascinating about this is look at the spring. These birds are heading back to Scandinavia about now, and they're virtually not seen on nocturnal migration counts. Reason for this, probably, is the birds we see in autumn we're seeing in the, very early in the morning on our migration counts, and they've been traveling through the night and they're looking for somewhere to drop down and feed. The birds during the spring, when they're heading off, they're not moving in the morning at all. They've gone, they're at the other end of the North Sea by the morning. So we don't see their departure. They're leaving at night. And at mo I do a lot of what's called nocturnal migration recording. So I have a, a recorder that I put out um, in my garden. and. Um, I get sometimes very large numbers of things like red wings going through calling at night. And they're all, by the time I wake up in the morning, are probably somewhere about 900 miles the other side or about 190 miles, sorry, the other side of the north, um, the country or over to the North Sea. So you don't see the arrival in the morning. Um, once we get into November, we see a species which everyone I think probably here takes for granted and probably doesn't have a lot of time for, frankly, but wood pigeons are a totally underrated creature. And if you go down to the Severn on a good November morning, there's a chance you'll see over 100,000 of these go through within a few hours. Um, the peak counts, the record count um, is over 200,000 in about a period of three hours. Now, what's happening with these birds? This is a real mystery. This is a bird we think we know about, but we don't truthfully know where all these migrant pigeons are coming from. It's thought it's from northeast England and Scotland, and they head on a southwesterly direction. Often they'll be counts in the Pennines, Staffordshire, come down through Herefordshire in quite good numbers. I often count three or four thousand in a morning through Herefordshire. But it's when they hit seven, there's a massive um, an amalgamation of all the flight lines, basically. And by the time you're at sort of old Seven Bridge, all the birds have been following the river valleys down and leading lines down. There's packs and packs of them going through and they're heading on a southwesterly direction towards West Wales, Ireland, or possibly the Iberian, down into the Iberian Peninsula. But no one has ever seen a wood pigeon flock actually heading out to sea and definitely leaving Britain. But there's no other way of explaining where 200,000 wood pigeons in a single morning just disappear to. They just go off the face of our radar. We see them and then they've gone. Bizarrely, when the wind swings towards the northeast, only about 10 days, two weeks after this big passage southwest, you often start to see quite large flocks heading back northeast, which indicates some of them have just decided actually the feeding down there isn't as good. I'm heading back to ground I know or to find new pastures in the north of Britain, but nowhere near the same numbers that have headed southwest, southwest just a couple of weeks before. 
again in spring, we don't see massive numbers returning. On Saturday morning when I was on the 7, we had a count of around 1,500 of these birds heading back in a northeasterly direction. It doesn't really take into account the huge numbers that we're seeing go southwest in autumn. So it's one of those mysteries that I think we at some point need to, when prices get cheap enough, and um, we, we, we need to put some radio tags on these birds and um, some GPS and work out what they're doing. I know they're a common species at the moment, but um, let's face it, passenger pigeons are the most numerous species on the planet, um, not, not many years before they became extinct. So um, it'd be nice to know what they're up to for their conservation and just fascination, to be honest. That really brings us to the end of the traditional fizzle migration year. You can see here the numbers that are going through, you know, up to 600, 700 per hour. That first week of November, bonfire night is really, somewhere around that is traditionally the peak of wood pigeon migration time. But you do need these really settled, high pressure, still frosty mornings. That's what gets them going. And even in Herefordshire, going across the centre of Hereford, I've seen single flocks of a thousand wood pigeons. So that time of year, eyes to the skies and very high, you'll see these dense packed flocks. You'll see some of the record counts. And this is very much where um, our part of the country comes into its own. As you can see, there's um, counts here from Gwent, Port Stewart, which is um, just by Kepstow, uh, with the record at the moment of over 200,000. But plenty of counts up over 100,000 from, from Peterscombe Gout, which is just a bit further beyond Newport. Um, and then again, down Christchurch Harbour, which would indicate these birds probably are heading out to sea somewhere. You know, they're heading out from the south coast, but possibly at massive altitude, perhaps five, ten thousand 10,000 feet, which is um, very possible for them to migrate out with any problem. Really, that's the end of the traditional year. But then we get sometimes with hard weather, we get what are called hard weather movements. And um, this is when species which um, need softer ground, particularly things like lapwings, golden plover, um, are forced out by hard frosts. And also in these movements, you get a lot of thrushes and skylarks occur. And they'll be heading off into Ireland, um, which gets fewer frosts, Southwest England, sometimes off into um, the continental Europe and down into Iberia again. And um, here we can see a, a, an incredible day down at Christchurch Harbour, where um, this is um, early January, um, with snow on the ground, snow um, showers coming in, and they saw 33,000 skylarks, 33,000 field fares, 12,000 um, red wings, just huge, huge scale of migration. It's a time of year where we don't think of it happening. Again, yeah, it just proves, just look at the skies and think what, you know, if the weather's hard in, in midwinter, you will see these flocks. I had a day um, in February this year when we had that slightly harder um, week of, of cold weather. And um, I had a day where I was just wandering about and I had regular flocks of blackwing and um, golden plover going through throughout the day, not regular species in Herefordshire at all anymore. Um, and you know, over the course of the day, I think I counted about two or 300 blackwings go through. And I wasn't, you know, I wasn't particularly looking, I was on other business for such that day. Um, so what makes um, a good visible migration site? Um, there's two forms really of visible migration, which I'm sure you will have picked up during the, during the talk. There's the in-off migration. This is seeing birds coming in off the sea, um, really from either Scandinavia, um, Europe, or potentially from Iceland and Greenland, if you're up in Northern Scotland or Lewis or Harris, um, Atlantic facing seaboards. Now this generally needs wind directions from where the birds are traveling. So in autumn, to see these movements, we're looking at um, light easterly airflows. And again, we want things like a bit of clag, a bit of overcast from our point of view, to lower the birds, to make them more visible. Perhaps a bit of, a, um, a bit of light rain is perfect. For them, they want it to be clear high pressure, blue skies, because they'll be at thousands of feet and traveling at huge speeds because of it. But then traditional visible migration watch is done along leading lines. Um, and this is when certain wind conditions and physical um, barriers create a backup of birds. So typical places of this are against the sea, um, an estuary or high ground. Land birds do not, if they can help it, want to fly across the sea. And they often put it off for as long as they possibly can. And I've drawn a couple of pretty hopeless hand-drawn maps, which I hope will indicate um, what's happening here, just to give you a feel of what, what visible migration, what, what creates this 
big build up of birds. So this is Sperm Point in East Yorkshire. Um, you probably wouldn't be able to recognise it from that. Um, but the Humber estuary um, goes up in a northwesterly direction and the finger of um, the finger of land um, extending down and eventually pointing in a sort of south um, westerly direction straight into our British southwesterly prevailing breeze. What makes this a perfect place? And in autumn, what happens is all the birds from Iceland, from northern, um, from northern Britain, and some that have hit the British coast coming across from Scandinavia further north, will fly into the breeze. This is the unusual thing. Diurnal migrants often like to fly into a light breeze, not with it. Um, so migration is often affected by having that slight head or sort of two third, you know, third crosswind sort of thing. And here, what happens is the birds hit. If they come down the coast, they've got the North Sea to one side and the Humber estuary channels them from their right hand side, from the western side. So you get more and more birds hitting the Humber estuary. They follow it heading east and they're hitting the birds which have hit the North Sea. And you get this massive funnel effect. And you can see how narrow Sperm Point becomes at its very tip. There's a place called the Narrows there, which is, um, we can throw a stone from one side of it to another. All of these birds end up going through this tiny patch of about 10 metres wide. And um, I've got a brief video, which I'll show you in a moment, um, which shows you how, how dense um, and how many birds can be travelling through this little patch. And also, this is a great point as with places as we've discussed for in-off migration. You can see my little poor arrow here with some of the species you might expect to see. This will be happening in a northerly, like northeasterly, easterly, or potentially even a southeasterly um, wind direction. This is when your Scandinavian patterines, things like red wings, field fares, and then your things like waders, long-eared owls, short-eared owls, even rare or scarce migrants like yellow-browed warblers, blithe eye lesser white throats, dusky warblers. This is when these will occur. So you can go to Spurn in autumn, and if it's blowing from the east, you're going to see these rare Siberian, Scandinavian vagrants, as well as lot big falls of the commoner migrants. If it's blowing from the southwest, you'll see this along the coast migration of things like finches, pipits, larks, um, and any, any um, thrushes that made landfall further north. This is the Seven Estuary, a um, bit of a diagram to show what's happening here. And you can see on its northern coast where I've marked Goldcliff and Undy, which are um, two of my visible migration sites that I record from very regularly. Um, you can see early season autumn migration here, which is British bred, I'm uh, sorry, I've cut the top bit off, or um, PowerPoint has, uh, British bred pipits, wagtails, finches, hirundines, all coming south in the autumn. And again, they hit this, they hit the sea, they hit the estuary, they don't want to cross it um, if the winds are too strong. Anything above about eight to 10 miles an hour will stop cross channel migration on a typical day. So if the wind's blowing from a southwesterly quarter, they will then fly southwest along the estuary until the wind either eases or they decide to stop for the day. And you get these big passages. But this is very much an early autumn phenomenon. By mid-October, most of the British birds have moved. It's dying off. It's pretty quiet. This is when we travel to the other side of the estuary. And you can see the other two visible migration watch points I watch from, which are both at the bases of the bridges. Um, Oust, which is actually the service station. There's a knoll above the insurance, but I don't know if anyone's been to Oust Seven View Services. There's an insurance building there, and behind it is a knoll, a hill that overlooks inland and the estuary, giving us the best of both worlds. So we can see all the thrushes pouring in from inland, hitting the estuary, then heading back up northeast into the wind. But this only works in a northeasterly. You can go here in a southwesterly in late October and you will barely see a migrant bird go along it. Basically, they're going across a huge broad front on days like this. Quite a few go along the estuary, but it's not forcing them to it. It's this northeasterly wind which is forcing them up against the estuary in bigger numbers. And you can see coming from the southeast, we have um, continental chaffinches I've marked on here. And early in the talk, at the start of our talk, we talked about these chaffinches under your bird feeder. These are doing the exact reverse of what they've just done in the spring. Uh, in the spring, these birds have headed down from Scandinavia, going along the, the North Sea coast of Europe, through the Netherlands, into Belgium, into northern France. Then they've gone into a northeast, uh, a north um, westerly direction, come across the Channel into Kent, Essex, sometimes Suffolk, um, Sussex, South Coast, 
and then they head across Britain in a in a northwesterly direction, with a lot of the wintering in Western Britain, Wales, and um, the northwest, where it is traditionally a little bit milder. But we get a lot of these birds head up the coast, and we regularly get counts of between two and five thousand chaffinches in a single morning. Um, amongst them, of course, we get some scarcer birds like bramblings, which I don't know if any of you have had any of those under your feeders. This winter, um, a wonderful Scandinavian finch, uh, and again, things like hoar finches, um, a relatively rare bird, um, and very much a bird that we think of as a woodland dweller, but I've seen them flying right across the top of the Severn Bridge um, on, on visible migration days. And those birds not come from the Forest of Dean, where there's a big breeding population, but a good breeding population. It's so tempting to think that hoar finch has just come across the estuary from 15, 10 miles away. And there's breeding hawfinches, yeah, under 10 miles. But that bird doing what it was doing, I would stake my life savings on it, was from Scandinavia. Um, because you just could see heading into a northeast under those conditions, across Britain during the course of the day before, hit the seven estuary, gone, fuck me, I don't fancy that today. I'm going to fly into this wind. And um, off it goes, trying to find a narrower crossing point somewhere up up the estuary a wee bit. Um, really, that brings us to the end of the talk. I've probably, I hope I've rattled them through it so I haven't bored anyone too much. Um, if you're ever interested in, um, in looking into visible migration, um, I haven't actually tightened down onto the, the PowerPoint, but there's a couple of, there's a very good website, um, which is called Trek Tellen, which is set up by two Dutch guys who are passionate about visible migration, nocturnal migration, everything to do with migration. And across, the, across Britain and across Northern Europe, and in fact now across the world, there are hundreds and hundreds of visible migration sites where sad people like myself spend hundreds and hundreds of hours monitoring what's going through under different weather conditions. And we all put our counts on there. And we can build up a picture of what's happening. We can build up a picture of bird populations, of good breeding seasons, bad breeding seasons, what different weather conditions do to different birds change your migration strategy and plans um, and over the over years and years we hope that it will become a you know fantastic database for conservation as as well as science um, so trektellen.nl is the website so that's worth having a look at um, and if you want to get into it a bit yourself and you just want to learn about identifying these very tricky species um, in flight. Um, a lot of it's done by call, so I recommend a website called Exeno Canto, X E N O dash C A N T O dot org, and that's got hundreds and hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of calls and flight calls of these birds. So if you're if you want to understand identification of daytime flying migrant you've got to get good at bird calls contact calls flight calls and it's worth listening to these um, and in terms of actually identifying them visually there's a great new book just come out this spring called flight identification of european passerines and um, it's a must for anyone that has any interest in it at all um, well i hope that's not been too dull and boring i haven't lost too many of you but um I hope it's been a bit of an introduction to um, to what's happening over your heads and relatively locally to you during the course of a year. Fab, oh, thank you, Dan. Um, oh, that was really really interesting. I'm particularly intrigued by that elusive wood pigeon. Um, so we'll just see if we've got any questions. Um, if you do have a question, you can pop it in the chat, and we'll read some out now. Um, so you might have answered this one already, but Louise Hughes has asked, whereabouts do you watch for migrating birds on the Severn Estuary? As I say, so early I mean, in spring, you want to really go in a northeasterly direction, even in spring this is, and you'll want to head to somewhere like Oust um, or perhaps to Redwick, Severn Beach are very good, but anywhere really on the eastern side of the Severn during spring, in a northeasterly or easterly wind. So we're due to get the next spell of that at the tail end of next week. It looks as though we might be getting a bit of that sort of cycle. So we've just had a couple of really good days with almost um, with around 1500 meadow pipits through a morning for the last couple of mornings. It's just now switched back to westerlies, which kind of kills it dead. Um, in autumn, early autumn, um, southwesterlies go to somewhere like Goldcliff, 
there's not many places better for seeing lots of meadow pipits, uh, lots of early season goldfinches, siskins, stuff like that. Um, definitely worth going to. And once you're into proper autumn, mid, late October, November, switches back to Easterlies, head over to the east side of the estuary again. And if you want to see the wood pigeons, frankly, anywhere in Herefordshire on a still morning, you'll see low thousands. If you want to see, you know, 20, 50, 100, 200,000, go to somewhere near Chepstow and you, you, you stand a good chance on a high pressure, still clear, crisp November morning. Thank you. Um, so Jill has asked, are there any rules or methods about estimating numbers with really large flocks of birds? Yeah, it's an interesting one. And wood pigeons are actually a, a prime example because they're often, you know, I had a day this year um, where I had individual flocks of around 5,000 wood pigeons going through. So you, what's called block count. I take tick clickers out with me and um, I often go with a friend of mine, Matt, who's probably as autistic as I am and that we need to know exactly to the number, ideally. But we tend to, with something like big flocks, we click by the the 10, the 20 or the 50, we break it down into manageable groups. It's something that you learn with years of experience, to be honest, and you get better at it. But you often sort of test yourself, you know, Matt takes a camera with him and we will often click through a flock, a flock and we'll come out at say, I think 2,700 wood pigeons in there that we'll have clicked in groups of say 50, we'll have gone, that, that little block there must be 50, that's 50, that's 50, that's 50. To each 50, we click on it. And we've taken a photo of it and then you actually break it down and count it afterwards. And you're normally within about 5%. It's amazingly accurate. Once you've done it, I mean, you know, I've been doing physical migration for about 13 years now, a lot. So, um, you know, but it does take practice, but that's the way to do it. But it's just practice. Go out there and look at big flocks. But for individual birds, you know, when there's... 1300 meadow pipits coming through in little groups, normally of twos, threes, tens, twenties. We just do it on an individual click and every single bird gets a click. And every half an hour, we put our records into a Trektelen app onto our database. Thank you for the record of it. Um, Rose Stimson has asked, have you noticed any long-term trend changes in the time you've been observing migrations? Yeah, I mean, hirundines are probably the most obvious and it's a bad one, unfortunately. You know, the, the numbers of swallows going through is down and that would be corresponded with the Trektelin recording rates from UK sites. There's, there's, fewer, there's fewer swallows going through. Productivity is definitely down. Um, insecticide use, um, habitat change, lack of, um, lack of nest sites with barn conversions and um, people not allowing them in stables, etc. Um, again, actually, uh, on the whole, it's, it's, it's a lot of negatives, you know, things like corn bunting and yellowhammer, which, you know, do migrate and were regularly recorded um, on visible migration sites 10, 12 years ago are now a real scarcity, you know, where you'd have perhaps had a couple of hundred yellowhammers go down through the seven in a typical autumn 10 years, 15 years ago, we might get half a dozen or 10 now. So yeah, negatives. Um, there are, I think wood pigeons are a positive, you know, um, we, see, we see more of things like great white egret, little egret going through on visible migration than ever before, but sadly, yeah, not, not many positives. Um, that's all the questions from the chat. Does anyone have any last questions they wanna raise? You can just wave at me if you do. Stella? You're on mute, Stella. Do you want to unmute yourself? Sorry, beg your pardon. Uh, what birds do the does he see on the Seven Estuary that would go to the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust in Slimbridge? Yeah, um, we can we have had things like the Buick swans go through on migration, which later that day have turned up at mm. Slimbridge. Um, and again, we sometimes see the white-fronted geese going in or departing on migration. An interesting record this year, one of the guys up in Norfolk who carries out visible migration. Um, the chaps at Slimbridge, the wardens watched, I think a flock of, I think it was, I think it was 27 Buicks leave on a, probably about three weeks ago in the evening. Yeah. And the following morning, he had a flock of 27 Buicks heading out over the North Sea, Northeast, so probably the same birds. So they were Good trapped gracious. across the country. 
recently there's been a really interesting one involving swans where there's been this is the time of year that hoopers go into Iceland go and um, guys up the east coast through Lincolnshire, Yorkshire into Scotland have been able to track these individual herds, flocks of hoopers actually from leaving the fens all the way up into northern Scotland. They've been mm. watching, you know, they've through their WhatsApp groups and through phone calls, they've been able to say, you know, there's there's a there's a herd of 20 on your way, and sure enough, half an hour later it turns up. But, no, we do see the Buicks and yeah, definitely we do see the Buicks and white fronts occasionally when they arrive in the park, but you know, not, not, not regularly. It's, yeah. Thank you. No worries. Thank you, Stella. That was a great question. Um, any last questions? No? Lovely. Um, well, I just say, Dan, there's lots of people saying in the chat, um, thank you so much. They've learned a lot. It was really interesting. So we'll just say another thank you to you for, for a really interesting talk and for giving us your time this evening. And no thank you, everyone, for coming. And we'll hopefully see you at another event very soon. Thank you very much indeed, Daniel. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Take care. Bye. <laughs>